Galatians chapter 4, let's just go to verse 4. There's so much I want to say, and I'm, I'm, I want to honor your time. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart, crying out, Abba, Father. This is the same thing he said in Romans 8. Therefore, you are no longer a slave. You are a son. And if you're a son, then you are an heir of God through Christ. You are no longer a slave to performance, religion, or the law. You are now a son of the living God. You ought to call yourself son. Jesus was so sweet. Can I, we talk about Jesus for a second? I'll close it down. Jesus was so precious. He was so sweet that he's... I've always, I've always been fascinated by the fact that Jesus will really meet you at the end of your faith. Whatever you trust him to do is as far as he can go. It's really only limited by what you'll believe. And Jairus is a ruler of the synagogue, which means he's a good Jew. And he comes to Jesus and he says, would you come to my house and and heal my daughter. She's sick. She's 12 years old. And Jesus says, let's go. How many of you believe Jesus could have just said it and she'd have been healed? Centurion did that. Remember the centurion come to Jesus and says, would you just speak the word? My servant will be healed. And Jesus said, man, that's faith. Remember? But Jairus doesn't have that kind of faith. He needs Jesus to come to his house. But Jesus doesn't complain. He just goes. But on his way there, a little woman with an issue of blood elbows her way through the crowd. You know the story? And she reaches hold and touches the hem of his garment. And the moment she touches the hem of his garment, she's instantly healed. And I've always believed that whenever she touches the hem of his garment and she's healed, and Jesus turns and finds her, and the whole crowd finds out that she was healed. That was the only thing that kept her from being stoned. Because an unclean woman like that's not supposed to be in public. She's supposed to scream out unclean. But the fact that she's healed, no one can prove that she was ever sick. I like to think Jesus turns and looks at Jairus. Like, we still need to go all the way to your house? Don't you? I mean, I just, I just Jesus was real. You just kind of think he took a second and went, you want to rethink it? And Jairus just pulls him, let's go. And they're not even there and servants come up and go, forget it, she's already died. And no doubt in Jairus' mind, he's mad at the woman with the issue of blood. If she hadn't touched him, we'd have made it. And Jesus says, now let's go anyway. And you know the story. I really only told you that to get you to the woman with the issue of blood. Because when Jesus, the Bible says when she grabs hold of the hem of his garment and she feels the power of God. And it just, just courses through her body. Jesus feels the contact. He feels the power. And he stops. He doesn't have to stop. He doesn't need to stop. It's not as if he's going to be energized and regain his strength if he stops. He doesn't stop for him. He stops for her. Because if he didn't stop, the Bible says when she grabbed his garment and she felt the power go through her body, she shrunk back in fear. If Jesus hadn't stopped, she would have lived the rest of her life thinking that she stole something she didn't deserve. And she shrunk back in fear thinking, oh, what have I done? And Jesus stops because it's in his heart to release her from that fear. So the word he uses to release her, it's the first time in the Gospels he ever says it. He turns to her and says, daughter, be whole of your plague. What did he give her? He brought her into the family. He gave her inheritance. Daughter, it's okay. You're part of the family. You deserve what you reached out and grabbed hold of. Don't shrink back in fear. It's yours. That is lovely. That is a lovely Jesus. Daughter, it's yours. If we don't restore a sense of sonship, we're going to shrink back in fear every time we need something from God because we're going to think God doesn't want to give it to us because we're going to think we haven't deserved it. I'll close with this story. I've had a great weekend. I've enjoyed sharing the word with you. I feel like this is an appropriate spot 
to stop, to stop this message. The disciples say to Jesus, Lord, teach us how to pray like you do. Wouldn't you do that too if you were with Jesus and you heard him pray? And you'd say, I want to pray like that. And Jesus didn't pray big, long, flowery, loud prayers. In fact, he condemned those kind of prayers. He prayed short. He prayed smart. He prayed direct. He prayed with confidence. He prayed with thanksgiving. They didn't know how to do that. Teach us how to pray. So Jesus gives what we call the Lord's Prayer, a lot of which has been fulfilled now at the cross. But they're pre-Calvary, and so he gives them a prayer. Obviously, it didn't satisfy them because the second he gets to the end of the prayer, he tells a parable. He says, how many of you would have a friend who visits your house at midnight? And on the inside of the house is a man who is already in bed with his kids. And the man comes up to the door and knocks as loud as he can and says, Hey, I need bread. I have a friend visit in my house, but I don't have any food. Will you give me some bread? And from the inside of the house, the man cries out and says, No, go away. I'm already in bed with my kids. And the man keeps knocking over and over on the door. And before long, he said, Imagine that the man yells out, I'm going to get up and give you whatever you want, but it's not because we're friends. It's because you won't leave me alone. The old King James uses the big word because of your importunity, which is just a word for because you are a nag. <laughs> I'm going to get out of bed and I'm going to give you what you need. Jesus doesn't bother to explain the story, but he does. You just have to have ears to hear it. The next words out of his mouth are, ask, and it's given to you. Seek, and you find. Knock, and the door will be opened. I don't think even that sunk in. So he tells another one. And he says, how many of you, if your son asked for a piece of bread, would give him a stone? Now, if you want to get to the heart of somebody, talk about their kids. So Jesus is told story after story after story, and none of them worked. So he appeals to your parental side. He's a good teacher. He says, how many of you, if your kid come up to you and asked you for bread, would give him a stone? How many of you, if your kid asked for fish, would give him a serpent? If you, being evil know how to give good gifts to your kids how much more will the father give one gospel says the holy ghost the other gospel says good things i think they're both equally good good things to those that ask did you know why he told that because he was trying to explain the story of the nagger you have to ask yourself, are you going to be the man on the outside, knock, 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 knock? I used to preach it that way. If you're not getting what you want from God, you ought to just keep knocking. And some of you need to get up here on the altar and beg God and knock again, knock again. I used to preach just like that too, that, that old-fashioned preacher voice and kick my leg and run all over the platform, spit and scream and moonwalk, whatever it took. <laughs> I kind of like see that. That's not the case at all. Because what Jesus says is, if your kid asked, wouldn't you do it? Where was the kid in that story? Think back. In bed, next to daddy. Jesus is giving you a contrast. Which one you want to be? You want to be the guy that gets what he gets on his own effort, knocks till his fingers are bloody? Would you feel better about it if he got it then? Or would you rather be the kid laying in bed next to dad? And I love how my friend John Sheesby says this. He says, I'd rather be the kid that reaches over and tugs on daddy's nightshirt and says, dad, can you give me a glass of water? And dad will always get up and give you that glass of water. I want to ask you tonight. The inheritance is yours. When are you going to tug on dad's nightshirt and believe it belongs to you?